Bethan, and I work for the National Poisons Information Service, or NPIS, I'll probably call it throughout, um, but uh, we, we work here in Cardiff um, as the Welsh Poisons Unit, so part of the wider UK, as, as Claire mentioned. Um, and today, I'm, I'm not sure how much everyone knows about us, um, we're not a patient-facing service, so we're not always sort of out there and everyone knows about us. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of what we are, what we do, um, some of the work we produce and a few little bits that are patient relevant, um, if that makes sense. So uh, first I'll just give a bit of an introduction to the MPIS. Um, as Claire said, we're a 24 hour um, service, telephone service, 365 days a year. Um, and we also do maintain our database, which is called Talkspace, if you can see the logo. Um, and this is really where we store all our information on basically what we base our advice on. Um, and as I said, unfortunately, we're not open to the public, but we are there in the background um, working with health professionals uh, such as NHS 111, clinicians, the ambulance service. GPs, um, even prisons, and especially hospitals as well. Um, on the side of that, we also work with uh, RCE, so the Radiation Chemical Environmental Hazards Directorate, um, that are for the uh, UK HSA, so Public Health England formally. Um, and we notify them of any chemical incidents or exposures which might hold a threat to the wider public or public health. Um, so, I mean, what we do essentially is uh, advise on the toxicity of lots of different things, um, of medicines, uh, drugs of abuse, so illegal substances, um, chemicals, cosmetics, cleaning products to gases, um, and plants and fungi, and lots of other things as well, um, lots of random things sometimes. Um, and essentially we, we can give information on the ingredients of those products or ingredients of concern um, how we expect them to their toxicity to you know the mechanisms of it and how it should progress um, any symptoms we might expect and uh, sort of the severity that they can get to as well um, so gone to we've got sort of a little bit of a, a traffic light system um, and all of our um, information sheets on Talkspace are sort of have a, an alert box so um, as you can see this is an example of the COVID-19 uh, test kit solutions which I'm sure you're all very familiar with and um, the little sort of uh, it looks like water the clear liquid that you get to mix your swab with um, we've had loads of calls about people sort of accidentally swallowing them or having them in their eye it, it ha does happen and um, we've had to put this as a new sheet in the recent years and it is a low toxicity substance so what we mean by that is we're not expecting it to cause any harm you know if you swallow it it might not be very nice but no nothing that we're concerned about um, that's mainly due to the small size really um, but other ones we have sort of the orange system where they are products that can potentially be toxic um, usually medicine so they have the potential to be toxic. It just depends on the dose that you take and um, how much of it you have. So that really can help us guide whether that patient needs to go into hospital or needs an assessment. Um, sometimes we base this on a what we call a suggested toxic dose. So below that level, we wouldn't expect any symptoms or anything to happen, um, essentially. Uh, and, and that does, oh, sorry, <laughs> that does vary a lot between every different drug as well. Um, and then finally, we've got the highly toxic, scary looking box. And um, we have that for a few medicines, some plants and things like that, but a lot of like strong concentrated chemicals and um, acids like hydrogen peroxide here. And most of these products basically tell us these, this patient needs to be in an A&E environment um, so they go straight in and, and this sort of system is useful for like NHS 111 or GPs they know if they see that you know we just need to send them in but maybe with the more like orange ones they might be wanting to call us and have a bit more advice on it so that is useful really um, I guess the only other thing to mention is just quickly the the kind of structure of our NPIS. Um, we are a unit here in Cardiff representing Wales, but 
we do answer calls all over the UK um, and we share our 24 hour rotor with our colleagues in Birmingham, Newcastle and Edinburgh. Um, so that's what make, makes up the whole UK uh, service. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm a specialist in poisons information, so I'm one of the scientists here that gives the information to the healthcare professionals. But we also do have an amazing team of medics who are on call 24 hours a day and know literally everything. <laughs> and um, we reserve the more sort of severe calls for them, you know, we'll refer it if there's a really complicated case or something that just needs a little bit more medical management as well um, than we can provide. So yeah, they're really useful. Um, so I guess to just talk a bit about our Cardiff unit specifically. So the Welsh National Poisons Unit or Ined Gwenwynai, Kenneth Lathol Cymru in Welsh. Um, and we are based in Llandoch Hospital in Cardiff. Um, we're on Gwenwyn Ward. Um, just to give you a bit of history, pre-COVID, um, we did actually have a poisons ward here that was actively treating poisoned patients with nurses specialising in it, and, and they were great. But unfortunately, lots of things are the same, but we, we, it has had to close after COVID. But we are still the Welsh National Poisons Unit. We're operating as part of AWTTC, um, undertaking a lot of our own products, uh, projects Sorry, that I'll, I'll go on to, um, I guess, just to highlight, we, we do have a Twitter page if anyone's interested. Um, just give we give information on sort of poison risks and recent news, interesting papers and stuff like that. So um, all the tweets are in English and Welsh as well, if anyone is interested. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, we, we take part in a lot of projects and do a lot of research as well. Um, so for every telephone inquiry we, we do have, we create a call record and, and we store that and that's the information we'll use later on um, in our research. So that includes a lot of sort of location of where the call's coming from, um, patient information like age, weight, things like that. Um, a lot of in-depth detail of the exposure as much as we can get of the poisoning, you know, like where did it happen, when, how much did they have, why did they take it, you know, um, circumstances like was it accidental or did they try to harm themselves? Lots of different things like that, that basically helps us make the assessment um, and give the advice ultimately. Um, so as well as that, we also grade all of our calls in severity and um, ranging from none, so no symptoms to severe or life-threatening. Um, symptoms and that's really useful when we're analysing our data. It's, it's one of the main things that we use really just to use it as a marker to assess things against. Um, it, it does really come in handy. Um, so I guess touching on the data that we use just to give you a few benefits and, and limitations. As I said, it's, it's a really in-depth source of data so it's, it's quite unique really um, in, in the way that that it is and what it holds and what we can use it for. Um, it can be used for a lot of things like frequency, so the number of cases um, you know, per year, per age group, per drug, um, lots of different things. And, and that really can help inform us of sort of future knowledge on poisoning and it often helps us inform at-risk patients and, and drugs that are chemicals that we need to be concerned of. Sometimes even new things that pop up, like, um, for example, sort of, we have, uh, obviously everyone knows sort of cannabis, but we have new sort of synthetic cannabis type products that have emerged in the last sort of roughly 10 years, maybe shorter, that have really taken off that are new, quite toxic things. And, you know, without having calls about them, we might not have necessarily known the, the extent. So it is really useful in that way. Um, I guess another example of, of the knowing the sort of epidemiology of it, so the spread of it, is um, we know from our data that accidental poisoning, so a lot of it taking your grandparents' medication by accident, um, occurs in the very end, so below five. Um, and it really isn't as common in five to ten. Um, they just sort of grow out of it. It does happen, obviously, but not as much. And then on the other side of that, we've seen that self-harm overdoses, most common in young teenagers, young adults. Um, but in the last few years, without having the data to, to show you, we, we really have seen that. There's a big increase in young teenagers, you know, like 12 to 14, really commonly taking deliberate overdoses. Um, 
mostly of sort of over the counter things like your paracetamol, your ibuprofen, but yeah, it's quite worrying, worrying stuff sometimes to see. Um, I guess in terms of limitations then, um, I mean, our main limitation is we can't follow up every case, so we don't know every outcome of every exposure. And that is what limits our data, really. But I guess how we combat that is we try to represent the poisoning inquiry and um, give insight into why we were needed in that situation, why they needed to call us. Um, and that works out sort of well sometimes. Um, and I guess it's just representation is the other thing. We don't get called on every single poisoning that ever happens. Um, and, and sometimes maybe we just get called about more severe ones. So there's a bit of a balance there, um, I guess. So going on to what we use our data for, we do publish a lot of it, but one thing that we do every year <laughs> as an annual report, and um, that is just really talking about our service use and uh, sort of common things, sort of trends that we see. Um, this is the 2021 report and in, in that year we had just under 40,000 telephone calls. Um, so it's it quite busy and, and you can see here, and um, this is sort of the, the usage of the service. Um, calls, so blue line are relatively steady at the bottom here over the last sort of, I guess, over 10 years. Um, the ones that are quite interesting are the, the talk space online website use, the red line has really got shot up. And especially the app use of the Talkspace app is in the last sort of since 2015 is, is really shot up. I think it's risen by 22% uh, in the last year. So it, it, that is really taking off. So that's useful. And, and then the, the purple one is just the consultant referrals. So the severe cases that we have. Um, so just a, another sort of example of our annual report and um, just give you a summary, really. Uh, this is the most common agents uh, that we had calls on and decided that they were severe enough to refer to a consultant. So they were quite complicated cases. Um, and in general, paracetamol is always what we get most commonly called about, I guess, due to its availability and common use. Um, but you can see here that 25% that of all the paracetamol calls we had, which is in its thousands, um, you know, a couple of thousand, was actually referred to a consultant. And, I think that's because people don't realise that, that in overdose, paracetamol can be quite quite toxic and cause liver injury and liver damage, um, if not managed. So that that is something that we do see quite severe cases of. Uh, equally, it does have quite a complex management, which involves a, a really effective antidote, actually. So that's another reason why we might refer to a consultant, because it can get quite complicated. Um, I think... Other interesting ones on, on here, we see drugs and misuse. As you can imagine, we get called on illegal substances. Um, I'd say one of the issues we have is we never truly know what is in these, these drugs. We, we can tell you how heroin or cocaine is supposed to act in terms of the poisoning, but the, there's certain reasons that we don't know exactly what that is or people aren't buying what they think they are. So those cases can get a little bit complicated sometimes. Um, I guess otherwise the, the fourth one is quite interesting as we go into winter slowly is antifreeze. Um, we get loads more calls in the winter about this, as you can imagine. And basically, it, you might not realise it is a very highly toxic chemical and even small amounts um, can cause sort of severe outcomes. Um, we do obviously have the self-harm cases with this, but in terms of accidental poisoning, um, one thing we do see a lot is people commonly put their chemicals into maybe just like a water bottle to keep it a bit easier to reach. Um, and we see that a lot of these people do end up maybe taking a swig of it and, and ending up needing treatment. Um, so that's a really good point to put out there. Never do that. Um, yeah, a bit of a, a sticky one. Um, so I guess a lot of the other ones are common, common sort of ph pharmaceuticals, some more toxic than others. Um, some are just commonly used, so that's why they're there. Um, but the plants and mushrooms, I think, is interesting as well. In autumn, um, we get a lot more calls about this because foraging sort of takes off in the autumn. And I think identification is the key here. Even when we get calls about it, it's hard to advise because we don't know which one it is. Um, recent months, we had loads of different calls about people worrying because there's a very toxic mushroom um, called, nicknamed the death cap 
um, lots of people were in that they've eaten that when they're just foraging for normal, you know, mushrooms to eat. And identifying it, I think, is the key. And then we can manage it from there. So um, I think that's why they're complex. And that's why we do refer them to consultants, which um, is really useful. Um, so just to touch on other sort of publications we do. And um, this is a poster that we presented at EPAC, which is our European sort of conference for toxicology. Um, this was about the anti-diabetic drug metformin, basically highlighting our NPS data, um, dose versus severity, and, and lots of different um, little demographic features of age and things like that. Um, we did this virtually, but usually we do go to Europe to all the different conferences. Um, and, and there's another one that our colleagues went to in San Francisco a few weeks ago, uh, and that was really interesting as well. So we love doing stuff like that. Um, I guess other things we do as well as abstracts and posters, we do scientific papers. Um, there's one on the on the left here, um, which is by our colleagues, including our late colleague Nikki, um, who worked on the potential cyanide poisoning and reported to us. And that's a really interesting paper. Um, on the other side, we've got a, a review of aluminium toxicity. Um, so just to show that we do do a lot of different types of research here, that's a literature review and poison centre data as well. Um, so I guess a little projects we're doing just to touch on slowly. Um, in the pandemic, we did a, a new project to us, um, as we usually look at sort of acute toxicity. So short term poisonings, you know, if you've been exposed, what happens? This permitted daily exposure project was a bit different. We looked at long-term toxicity, so things like carcinogenicity, reproductive risks as well. Um, and that was really interesting for us. And we basically calculated a value um, at below this, it would be safe for people to be exposed daily to this and they wouldn't have these outcomes. Um, and now these, are, these documents are used in industry. So that was really interesting to do. Um, and I guess the other one is we are a big part of global public health um, we have done projects in Myanmar and Ethiopia, um, multiple training product, uh, projects that teach the staff there to do our, our job essentially. We help them build their poison centres and, and just teach them about common poisons as well. Interestingly, they have lots of different common poisons to us and it's interesting to just have that relationship. But Talon, one of my colleagues here is on his way probably today or tomorrow, I think, to Kazakhstan, where he's gonna do a, a whole new training project with them. So it's really exciting as well. Um, and I guess just to move past sort of what we do in terms of our, uh, you know, projects and things, as, although we're not a patient facing, um, you know, service, we do like to sort of try and educate and engage where we can. Um, I think a really good resource for anyone, you know, who might even be worried that they have been poisoned or someone they know, the NHS website actually does have really good, clear guidance on, on signs and symptoms to look out for and, and different sort of um, things that you can do and who to call when, when you think you are exposed. Um, and equally, we have a few resources, which I'll show you now quickly, um, on our website, the MPIS website. Um, I can email them to anyone who wants them. Um, and the first one is our low toxicity poster. Um, it might not be too clear, but it just outlines lots of different really common products that are low toxicity. We're not concerned about, but it's useful for people at home, especially with kids. Um, something you might think like, I guess, like some paints or ink or cosmetics or cleaning products, you might be really worried. Um, but looking at this, you can see that they might cause a bit of nausea, make you feel a bit, ugh, but they're not going to cause long term damage. And that's really reassuring for some people. So, um, yeah, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to pass that on. Um, I guess another one, especially with kids. And um, this is a leaflet about um, keeping your kids safe in the garden, essentially. And it outlines a few poisonous things to look out for, a few plants like aconite, yew, um, that are severely toxic, ones we're really concerned about. And it gives some tips as well, again, not to transfer your, your things, chemicals into drink bottles. Um, and, but I think the main thing I would say with the garden is just be maybe a bit more aware of what species of plants you actually have in your garden if you've got kids, because that really helps you to protect them. So I think that's, that's a good point as well to research that. Um, but yeah, the loss of do's and don'ts, some might, might be a bit obvious, but um, 
Same thing again, this is, but for the household, um, so as you can imagine, chemicals and cleaning products are more in, in view. Um, things like alcohol, cigarettes, a bit more, well, a lot more toxic to kids than adults. Um, and again, there's do's and don'ts there and just little tips as well. So I'm happy to pass that on. Um, my email is there. Um, it's a bit long, sorry. But if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy for you to get in touch or, you know, on Twitter, email, whatever. But yeah, thank you very much for listening to me.